Love you. That's it. Finish. Now I'm by myself. It's all right. But, you know, it's kind of, I don't know, it's kind of sad, but it's okay. Let them be well and that's all. everyone, my name is Frida Weisel and on this channel I explore many topics related to Jewish life and now in a series of videos I'm looking at the famous Jewish Catskills, the region north of New York City where Jews have been summering since the 1920s and where Hasidim continue to summer today. There are several famous pop culture movies about the Catskills, from Dirty Dancing to the scenes of The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, hands down the film that has most touched me and moved me and made an impression on me is the beautiful documentary Four Seasons Lodge. It is a documentary about the Catskills but so much more. It's about Holocaust survivors, about aging, about friendships, and above all, resilience and to me, a good cry. So with me today for my long form interview series is the documentary film director and producer Andrew Jacobs. Andrew Jacobs is a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, documentary filmmaker, staff writer at the New York Times, where he covers health for the science desk. He's also board president of the Catskills Borscht Belt Museum in Ellenville, New York, a new cultural institution dedicated to the golden age of the Catskills resort era and its impacts on American culture. Welcome, Andrew, and thank you so much for agreeing to do this. Thanks for having me. Thanks for your interest in the movie. And uh, also, your shirt is very topical. Is it? Is it something you wear every day, or I wear? Uh, I, I advertise both the museum and our festival. Any chance I can, I'm, I'm pathetic in that way. Um, Borchfeld Fest is our annual uh, street fair and cultural festival in Ellenville. Comedy, uh, music, art, and food. Uh, July twenty seventh, twenty eighth. So please come. Awesome! Great. I actually. I'm going to be doing a segment, uh, publishing a segment of visiting the Borscht Belt Museum. So that's going to be a little bit of advertisement. I, I went there without an appointment and I ran into Alan Frischman. I'm sure you know him. He gave us the, the tour. Andrew, how did you get to do this lovely film? What, what, where did it all begin? So in uh, summer of 2000 and five i believe it was um i was doing a series of articles for the new york times about summer life in the catskills the final story in the series was about four seasons lodge i uh it was in late august i was driving around uh i was at a bungalow colony and talking to people and they mentioned um i should go down the road to four seasons lodge there's a really interesting bunch of people there holocaust survivors I was immediately curious, uh, so drove over to the bungalow colony, uh, walked up to the lawn, met a bunch of people, met Jaime Abramowitz, who uh, is sort of the guy who runs the place, was immediately smitten by him and by them, their stories, uh, hung out, talked to them for a while, and then when he told me that the, the following summer would be their last summer they were going to sell, I thought, wow, these are this something has to happen with this group. I have to do something. Maybe it's a, a longer article, a magazine article. Maybe it's a book. I certainly didn't think a documentary. I thought maybe something in writing because that's what I do. But I also realized that a book or article wouldn't really capture them and their community they had created. They're sort of this world. Um, so I thought maybe a film, not that I had knew how to make a film, but it seemed like the best format 
for telling their story. So I did end up writing a short article for the Times, uh, but by the time it came out, it was already September. The story got buried. It didn't get much attention. It was short. And that gave me more kind of um, motivation to try to do something more with them. Here's the documentary trailer. It's raining for a change. I lost my parents, sisters, their husbands, their children. And when I came out of the concentration camp, I was all alone, no home, no nothing. So you don't forget those sticks. I'm 91 years old. And last night, I danced. There's a little problem with sex. Maybe you have any remedy for it. A young girl. <laughs> She'll kill him right away. <laughs> I'll send you what you believe it. I'm 82, 83. Did I go to a window? Most of the survivors, when we arrived in the United States, we tried to find each other. We created our family from our friends because we lost our family. Wherever they go, they can wait for the moment to come over here to see each other and to be free. For sure, a half a million Jews used to go up to the Catskills. It was the place to get out of the sweltering city. They had wonderful summers, and nature took it back. Because being a stranger in a country or an immigrant is a very difficult life. When I first came here, I couldn't believe that these are all my kind of people, and this is like the ghetto. He's going to live like everybody else till they die. <laughs> Hey, hey, don't rush! If you give a little tilt to the side, we'll have the party and the, and the gas. Jaime! Jaime! Jaime, take this out. Jaime, you have the bill here? Jaime! 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 Yes, Jaime! What a life, what a life. Life is not easy for everybody, but life can be beautiful even when it's not so easy. Doesn't matter where we are, doesn't matter where we go. We just want to be together. Yeah. That's the way it goes. Hi, me. How did you get them not only to agree to be filmed, but also to be filmed in such candid moments? You see these people bickering. You see them what feels like they're not performing for the camera. They were pretty amenable as a group, I think, right away. I think they recognize they their limited time, you know, remaining time um, in general. They're in there, you know, they were they were at the time in their eighties, mostly the youngest person there was seventy eight. You know what the blue one are. They they strong. You cannot do them all the guy. I did that. Oh, you did it. So you're strong. I cannot do that. And I think they recognize the value of recording them and their world. Um, I think the other thing you don't, you know, early on in the filming, they, I, I would say they were more self-conscious. But when you do um, what we call sort of verite documentary filming, which is you just have the, ro the cameras are rolling all the time, you're not really setting things up. You're just sort of following them around with the camera. People forget the cameras are there. They forget the mic's there, which is hard to believe because it's you know, someone carrying a boom mic over their heads. But they forget, and they become more natural. Um, probably not entirely, obviously. But I think for, to a certain extent, they become less conscious of the camera being there. I was wondering, because I didn't see anyone mic'd. Usually when I watch a documentary, I'm... I'm watching for people being mic because I'm thinking about the process of micing someone as having them go into performance mode. But I guess you had a boom mic instead. We had a boom mic. There were certain scenes uh, which you don't see in the movie, but we did sit down interviews with everybody, uh, pretty much everyone who wanted to be interviewed. We did a long interview with them getting their stories. So we have those in a box somewhere. <laughs> which at some point I need to get out. But, um, you know, that you we used a mic for. But otherwise, yeah, it was a boom mic, and it was meant to be out of sight, certainly for the uh, camera. 
um, not for the in not for the people we interview. It was quite obvious, but um, oddly, people just get used to the situation around them, I guess, and um, allowed them to be a little more natural. You know, one of the things that really moved me on rewatching the documentary now before the interview is their Holocaust stories. I think, especially because I do content on YouTube and I get a lot of crazy comments about the Holocaust. It really gets to you when you see a lot of comments all the time saying that the Holocaust wasn't real or all sorts of conspiracies around the Holocaust. I tend to delete yeah. these comments because my my regular viewers don't want to come to a discussion forum when where that's happening. Um, but it was such a change of pace to see these people talking about their Holocaust stories. One particular scene uh, that I want to share here is the scene where this gentleman talks about stealing a picture out of a German's car of a postcard. I have worked on German class in, in the camp on the Alto Unibach. And we had Hitler's car, they had a Maybach, his two cars, the best. This picture was a postcard. So they took a Jew with a towel and cut in his face, they acted Jews here with a beard, see? They said a German Gestapo. You could see there's a postcard, they were written a lot of things on it. So I steal it from his glove compartment. So the guy said to me, well, I was looking, Joe, one day you're gonna be shot. I said, I wanna have this. You try in daytime, you know, to make the best of it. You play music, you go in the parties. I go and dancing to dance. here and everything. But then, it is, the time comes back. I do off the night, back. I have terrible dreams. It's very hard to believe. I don't believe in myself. Yeah. Bring back bad memories. This is always behind your head. See the bodies there? No psychiatrist in the world can heal you for that. This always comes back on you. You live with this. I'm wondering if you can speak to your experience of telling these people's stories. What was it like? What were they like about it? What was it like for you? I think, you know, going into the film, I didn't want it to be a film about survivors and their memories and the horror and, you know, not to be diminish other Holocaust films, but I didn't want it to be just another Holocaust film. Um, I wanted it to be about their current life and how they m navigate living in the world with this tremendous burden, this tremendous trauma on their shoulders. And I found the best way to do that was to capture the moments when they were casually, often it was a kind of a casual banter where they would insert stories about their Holocaust experience. Um, and I thought that was really sort of, to me, very powerful, the way they integrated those experiences. Um, you know, they could, from one minute to them, they could, they could tell a story, a horrifying story, and then the next minute they'd be playing cards and laughing. And I don't pretend to understand what that's like to live with that these kind of memories crowding your your head but they you know there was a certain i don't want to say they were at peace but they were they had these were survivors who at some point because of just the way they're they're made really um they had found a way to find joy in everyday life that uh was to me unusual um they took they found pleasure in just each other's company they really looked forward to spending time together, um, and that was how they approached life, um, is finding the light, finding the joy. And so if, if occasionally a, a memory, a Holocaust memory sort of crowded into the conversation, they could jump right in and then jump right out. And I don't think that's true for a lot of survivors. I think a lot of survivors really bury 
um, that that trauma, and it's too painful to talk about. But these people were sort of a select, self-selecting bunch, and that they just made a decision to hang out with each other and spend time with each other because they knew these stories were going to come up again and again. This was not the bunch that was going to bury the stories, except for there were a few exceptions to that, of course, but for the most part. Even the one woman who we see her walking with a shopping bag over her head when it's raining. It's a very, very endearing moment. And she's, she's kind of welling up, but she doesn't want to talk about it here and there. But they seem to want to be in an environment where there, there are, it, where it is openly discussed. I think, you know, from what my understanding and, and talking to a lot of children of survivors, I feel like there were two. There are two kinds of survivors in the world: those who don't, who want to forget it and do all they can to to avoid the topic, and those who kind of that's the, it's in their DNA at this point, and they need to talk about it a lot, or not need, but it, they're not going to avoid it. And so, how can you how can you not make references to this all throughout your day? I mean. I don't want to exaggerate and say this is all they talked about because obviously I was there with the camera and that was a lot of my interest, but I was struck by how much the, yeah, the atrocities sort of were part of their daily conversation. Is there a scene on that note that is your favorite scene that we can play here? Well, I, you know, I thought a scene that, Actually, the two scenes that really illustrate it, one was after synagogue, um, a Saturday, um, actually, I think it was a Friday. It was, a, they went to services. We have a little synagogue on the property. And afterwards, these men in their sort of shul suits were kind of trading uh, almost competitive um, horror stories about uh, who had it worse. You know, the the boy who was, you know, the 16-year-old who was uh, removing gold teeth from the corpses of Jews who'd been gassed, or the guy who, the, the, the other kid who was a, a, uh, being experimented on by Mengel, you know, and, and they were at one point sort of trading these stories in a very casual way, and I thought that was, and then uh, another day, a bunch of women were having the same kind of, it was less, I would say, competitive but just sitting around and um, talking, you know, recalling stories. And um, that, uh, those stood out for me. But what's the second one with the women? I'm trying to remember the scene. They're kind of talking about faith and <clears throat> do they believe in God <clears throat> and um, why some believe in God and why some don't. And this woman... Um, uh, Regina Petersiel talks about how she can't believe in God after seeing uh, children thrown off balconies by the Nazis, and she saw. She said, "How can I believe in a God that did do it? Did nothing to stop that?" <clears throat> and I think, um, and then there are other people who just have this faith that uh, they still believe. So Did I survived. Why didn't she? Why didn't he? Why didn't my you know, you you know, you know, seven years old? Whether you went to the right or you went to the left. He called in the Gestapo and said, here is a Jewish child. Yes. So if you have to believe in something, you have to hang on to something, no? I wish I could say I believe in every... And All right. I don't think I should talk about that you because know, it's a very touchy subject. And not a thing. Yeah, I have certificates from Auschwitz. They found on a revier, the former revier, papers that did experiments on me. Yeah, and yet they were very traditional. There are these moments where they, they're in the synagogue with their yarmulkes. I guess this was the case for everyone, even if they, that they were part of it. It was a traditional community, even if they came out of the Holocaust saying that they can't believe in God anymore. Is that what it was? Yeah, I mean, I would say... Um... Probably half and half, you know, half didn't, were not interested in religion. Um, pretty much everyone, you know, liked candles. I mean, there was a certain um, religiosity, I would say, among everyone. But then from there, um, you know, some would attend shul and some wouldn't. I would say probably more self-identified as 
Jewish and religious than perhaps other groups of survivors that I've met who want to sort of separate themselves from that. Um, yeah, so they, I would say they have more faith than, than others have met, but this is a generalization. Like, yeah. I want to speak now of the particular context of Four Seasons Lodge, which is it's a bungalow colony where people are going for presumably two months in the summer and they are living in this arrangement of little bungalows. You want to explain what that environment was like and maybe how it was different from other bungalow colonies? Yeah, so bungalow colony, is a, it's almost like a mini shtetl, I would say. It's almost a communal kind of way of living in that everyone has their own little cabin. I would really call it almost like a cabin. Uh, they generally had one bedroom, some had two, and with a little kitchen, a little front seating area. But most people would spend a lot of time in the, either the casino, which is the name given to sort of the entertainment hall. I don't know why it was called the casino. There was no gambling <laughs> taking place, but that's what they were generally called. And then a dining structure and then a, a card room. Uh, so with a lot of time spent um, you know, every evening after dinner, uh, there would be cards and everyone would sort of come in and have cake and coffee. Uh, and then the, the, the bungalows are sort of uh, arranged around a green, uh, you know, like an open green, uh, usually sort of along the perimeter. So it's um, everyone's sort of the, the bungalows are facing each other. So it's very cozy that there, you know, there's not much space between them, uh, maybe six feet, eight feet max. Uh, between each bungalow so you know um a little village you know a little shtetl and and four seasons lodge i would say is not much different from other places they were all kind of uh oh i meant forgot to mention the pool uh tennis courts paddle tennis courts uh in this case the tennis courts were long abandoned and overgrown same with the paddle uh paddle ball court overgrown um pool was pretty well maintained um but uh Otherwise, pretty similar to other bungalow colonies out there. What about uh, Hasidic bungalow colonies? Did you also research that, and did you see a difference? Yeah, I've, I've been to quite a few for the series of articles I did. I would, you know, drive up. You know, these places are pretty open. You can just pull right up and walk on the lawn, and people are always friendly. So I would say that the Hasidic uh, bungalow colonies, the pool would have a, 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 a machiza. Am I pronouncing that machiza, right? Machiza, yes. Yes, Mahisa, yes. <laughs> um, uh, uh, separating, you know, there's a sort of um, shielding the pool from outside uh, eyes. It has and, like two, it has two doors, like a dog park, right? Yeah. yeah. So you yeah, don't, when you, you probably go in... could explain this better than I, I could. <laughs> um, uh, and I'd say otherwise, the Hasidic, you know, often the, the, the casino was, you know, transformed into kind of a, a Talmud, uh, uh, I don't know what the word would be for a place where of learning um, men, uh, you know, would, would sit and, and read and study. Um, but otherwise, I would say they were pretty much the same. Um, the some of the Hasidic ca uh, colonies, people have added on to their bungalows, so maybe there's a little bigger, uh, a little more modernized, but really not much. A lot of these places are unchanged in decades, you know, um, they built in the, the, the 30s, 40s, um, and still the same. Yeah. Wow. What did you write about? Did you essentially report on what, what it was like when you wrote about Hasidic bungalow colonies? I think for the, it, it, I can't remember if I did one specifically on a Hasidic bungalow colony, but I spent time there because that's how I met people who led me to other stories. Uh, for example, a story I did on the baseball league. Um, I think in this case, I'm, I'm more of an orthodox baseball league with all the colonies who participate. Then I did another story on sort of what would young um, religious folk do on after Shabbos, uh, you know, on a Saturday night and where they would hang out and meet other young people. Um, this is not Hasidim, obviously, because they wouldn't have that mixing. But it took a lot of that was at the Walmart. A Walmart was a big hangout place in the parking lot or in, inside, uh, or a bowling alley, which is no longer there. I mean, Shalane's. Um, but uh, the, the bungalow colony itself, I would say, 
I don't think I did a story specifically on that. Yeah. One of the big differences between the Hasidic bungalow colonies and Four Seasons Lodge is obviously the age demographic. Because in the Hasidic communities, bungalow colonies, they are there are so many children. It's like the whole green space is filled with children's bikes and children running around. And in your documentary, it's like everyone is over 70. Essentially, I think the median age was in the 80s. Did, did the film invoke for you the questions about aging and the experience of aging? And how so? How do you think the film speaks to that? I think actually for me it was very inspiring because it showed a really uh, appealing way about of aging with um, really your chosen family. Um, in this case, um, their kids, that was a good point about like the lack of children because I see the colonies, there'll be toys all over the lawn and kids and this one, there are very few kids. And Partly it's because their children, um, I think, were not interested in spending their summers with their parents, which is normal. That, you know, you get to a point, you, you want to have your own life. I think there was also something particularly painful, and this is my own projection, perhaps, but I got the sense that a lot of their children, they would come up, a lot of them would come up for a, a day or a few hours visit and then they would leave you know and i think to be the child of a holocaust survivor is very very difficult not for everybody but i think it can be difficult because here's your your parent this person you look up to and love and to he and to to be around their pain is i think doubly difficult um you know no one wants to be aware of your parents suffering and and like I said, these these survivors were, you know, quite frequently um, interested in talking about. And this is a really long, long-winded way of saying I don't think their kids really wanted to spend a lot of time with in the summer. They don't want to spend their summers sitting around with Holocaust, Holocaust survivors, hearing them talk about stories of the past. Um, so it was what you had is uh, and. These people, like I said, they it was their chosen family. They had chosen each other to be their um, to be with all the time, and so that um, is inspiring. In that, um, I could see as uh, getting older, wanting to be with friends and people who ch who choose you, who want to be with you. They also had an attitude to life that was incredibly infectious in in the film we see them joking about sex um wonderful like there's just a tremendous sense of humor that they have about aging and sex and also you know someone has alzheimer's someone has kidney failure someone is talking they're all talking about it took me five minutes to get there and now takes me 20 minutes they seem to to talk about aging but also to laugh about it like to have a to have a very big sense of humor about it. Yeah, I, I I would say it's almost a survival skill, and this you could say of Jews in in general, um, is we have developed an ability to laugh when we should be crying <laughs> because <laughs> you know if you have the choice, we're gonna laugh or cry. Is laughing is better. So I think you know. Humor is a way of dealing with um, the traumatic past, um, and which is perhaps why many, many stand-up comics are Jewish, and why, and this ties back to what I'm doing with the Borschfeld Museum, why um, American humor is very much Jewish humor, and, and trying to understand how that happened, and um, how, you know, why are Jews uh, so many Jews comedians, and why is humor such a big part of how we interact? And I think it's because of generations of trauma um, and difficulty, um, persecution. Humor was often um, the only way 
um, are one of the only ways to kind of to deal with that. That's very interesting because I didn't make the connection with, of course, the Borscht Belt is so famous for being the cradle for all of these these original comedians. And this is a very different context of comedy. But yeah, I hear you. That's a very interesting thought. Um, on that note, do you mind sharing your own uh, connection to this? Obviously, you're Jewish. Like, do you have any particular what's where's where do you come from personally to this subject well i grew up in new jersey i was born in newark my immediate family were not survivors um but you can't not be um you know brought up in a jewish community and not be uh aware of the holocaust and and survivors and they're they are in your they were of course not so much anymore um uh, so few are left, but um, they're in your midst, and um, you know you. This is part of your cultural kind of DNA. What about the Borscht Belt? Do you have a personal connection to it? The Borscht Belt, I had very little. I mean, I came up with my family um, a little bit as a child, um, but I we were not kind of regulars. I would say. Uh, uh, I have a house up here in the Catskills, um, about 15 minutes away from where Four Seasons Lodge is. So um, I'm connected to the region that way, perhaps more powerfully in a contemporary sense. Um, I live near Ellenville, and Ellenville is a place uh, that I've grown to love and feel connected to and and um and that again relates back to the museum but i think the, the short answer is i don't didn't have that much um connection to the borscht belt i would say it's interesting that it's becoming a whole phenomenon like it has an afterlife the the cat skills um like now there's so much media and there's so much culture being produced around its memories like you can connect to it on those terms on its on its afterlife terms yeah i think we have um marvel's so mazels to thank for that um it's amazing how just one show um can familiarize an entire generation with this part of history that was largely forgotten um you know even now i most people if i say borscht belt uh, they have no idea what I'm talking about. Most Americans, obviously, if you're Jewish and you're a certain age, um, you'll know. But uh, young Jews even don't have any idea. If I say um, Marvelous Miss Maisel, or I mention Dirty Dancing, then there's a recognition. You know, it's a limited awareness. It's a, it's a, it's sort of a, a, I would just say an awareness. So yeah, that that was a thing, wasn't it? But no, most people don't realize that there were, that every summer a million people from the city would migrate to this place. There were, you know, more than a thousand hotels and Mughal colonies and the biggest nightclub in the country was up here. And, um, you know, is all the, the giants, entertainment giants uh, came up here and performed. And, and of course, the comedians, this was the proving ground. So I think that... Um, that period in history has been a bit lost and you know we are trying to bring it back because or bring back a uh, better appreciation for it because i think there's a lot of lessons to be learned um especially now with what's happening in the world in our country with anti-semitism and you know <clears throat> the big takeaway here is the reason the the porsche belt existed was because of discrimination right i mean the only reason jews came here is because they couldn't go to other hotels they were barred from uh staying at gentile owned hotels so what did they do they created their own vacation world and i think that's a significant um uh, data point that people and it wasn't that long ago right um so i think it's important for younger people to know that and then also you know there's a lot of joy in in this period and i think it's that's a rarity in in jewish history right i mean you go to a jewish museum and it's a lot of heartbreak it's pogroms and holocaust and i think um this is a rare time when jews took you know took some lemons and they made lemonade they you know they were they were discriminated against so they created a fabulous 
uh, summer world uh, that actually ended up having a really big impact on American culture because, like I said before, all the show TV shows from the 50s up to even to now, I mean, from, you know, Larry David to Seinfeld to most sitcoms, many of the sitcoms that we grew up watching were written by Jews who had gotten their start in the Catskills. And so that humor transferred to Hollywood and transferred to the cultural, you know, DNA of of what it means to be American, you know? Well, you said that American humor is Jewish humor. Is it possible to explain what Jewish, what American humor is? I would say if you think of stand-up comedy and you think of the kind of self, the way a, a stand-up comedy gets on a stage and interacts with an audience and is very self-deprecating and very, you know, prods the audience and that stand-up, that's, that's Jewish stand-up comedy. That's Woody Allen, Roddy Dangerfield, Milton Berle, Sid Caesar, Joan Rivers, all of that, all those people, um, that suffused American humor. Uh, how do I how do I describe it? It's hard, you know, it's kind of a hard thing to tease out. Um, but I would say that a, a, if you you can, you know, trace back the sort of the, the style of joke telling, the tenor, the content. That very personal, you know, um, we take it for granted that most stand-up com- comedians sort of bear their soul. Uh, you know, they poke hole, they poke themselves. I mean, that's how Jewish is that, right? You know, mm-hmm. the self-doubt, this um, uh, self-deprecation. So I would posit that that in many ways, American humor is Jewish humor. Um, obviously, it's not the whole story, and it's a mix, and. There's lots of other elements to it, but um, you know, I think it's 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 uh, we Jews sort of dominated the world of comedy. We still look at Hollywood. I mean, uh, we're we're two percent of the population, and look how many Jews there are in in entertainment. And this is why I get a lot, a lot, a lot of YouTube comments about Hasidic Jews <laughs> being c- controlling the media. You know, obviously, it's the. Uh, anti-semitic control people. the media yeah mm. yeah people really like to take you know there's there's a lot of of taking the jewish story and turning it into a conspiracy theory and it's like festering in this whole internet underground but let's not talk about that because that's very <laughs> depressing <laughs> we're not talking about depressing stuff we're talking about the happy period of jewish history speaking of of the Borschfeld, and and that era, we know about all of these glamorous resorts and the glamorous people who came. And usually we hear about the hotels, but not so much about the bungalow colonies. And definitely, I never before heard of a bungalow colony of survivors. Was this an anomaly that there was a bungalow colony of Holocaust survivors? No. No, there are quite a few. Uh, at the time I did the film, there was another one called Silver Silver Lake. Uh, I think it's still around, and there were a few others. There were there were quite a few others, and as those as they closed, people would sort of gather in. In fact, Four Seasons Lodge was was not that old. It was only created in the, in the eighties. I, I should say, it only became Four Seasons Lodge in the eighties uh, when other bungalow colonies that they were at were closing, and so they sort of consolidated into this one place. I would say there were quite a few. Um, uh, bungalow colonies. But I think your point about bungalow colonies is really interesting because you're right that hotels kind of dominate our understanding of what the Borscht Belt was. But most people actually were uh, in bungalow homes because it was affordable. It was a class. It was something, uh, it was a class differentiation. I mean, if you had money, uh, you could afford to spend uh, a week or maybe longer in a hotel. Most people couldn't do that. Uh, you know, the, the, the great thing about the, the Borscht Belt, the Caskills, was it was very um, uh, democratic in that anyone could go. You know, you, a taxi driver, a, a, a garment uh, center worker uh, could all afford a week in a bungalow colony. Uh, there was even a lower level of accommodations called a, a kucha lane, <clears throat> which was... Um, <clears throat> a, a, a shared kitchen you didn't have your own kitchen 
uh, you share a kitchen and that was even more affordable. Um, you know, it was sort of almost like a rooming house. So you had different levels. You had the, 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 the A plus hotels, the gross singers, the cutchers, the Neville, the Concord. And then you had the, 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 the next level down with the 250 houses, which refers to the number of rooms around 250. And those were generally sort of smaller family run operations. Um, so you kind of had this whole melange of economic um, groups, you know. What was the Kacha line? Kacha line, which uh, I think in Yiddish means cook, <clears throat> cook by yourself. Cook, cook alone, yeah. They were, they were an outgrowth of uh, the original farmhouses. So for, for, for watchers of your show who don't know, um, the, the, the whole thing began with farm, Jewish farmers who um, start in the 20s started allowing boarders to stay in their house. They had an extra room. You know, they had an uncle from the city who had tuberculosis and come up for the, the summer, you know, and then they realized they could make more money uh, from borders than from farming. That they are, The soil here is terrible. So they started uh, a, a summer boarding business. And so Kuka Lang's got to grew out of that where maybe the farmer would build a structure uh, or build a, a, a room with a kitchen, a share a kitchen, so everyone could come and cook their own meals. And then later on, the hotels, you would obviously not cook, you would be served your meals. Um, and so that was a differentiation. But for people who are more modest means, you would say to cook a leg. With regards to Four Seasons Lodge, the documentary opens with them having sold the bungalow colony and they're doing their last year, and then they decide to revisit it. What was going on there? Like, what do you think inspired them to start that whole conversation? I think, um, to be totally honest, I think the experience of having us there for two years, well, it started out as one year, having these uh, camera people uh, living with them and marveling at them and, and really making them realize what they had, it was so special. Basically... <clears throat> they they didn't want to give it. They just changed their mind. They basically said, "You know what? What we have here is so so cool." And yes, um, we complain about work not getting done, and Jaime and Carl complained about getting older. But at the end of the day, we love it. We love each other, and let's try to spend more time together because all we have is time. And so they kind of just did a one eighty and decided they didn't want to sell. And then when that happened, they had to kind of get themselves out of the contract because they had signed a contract. So they had to get lawyers and and it dragged on for a, 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 another two years. So they had two more years together. And then by the third year, um, I think they were done. By the end of the documentary, I guess this is spoilers, but I guess I should say spoiler alert. But by the end, we see a lot of in memoriam, which is not surprising. They were all really elderly. Um, what was it like for you to do documentary with throughout the film? We don't know how people passed away, but it's clear that quite a few people ended up passing away. I think at sort of a certain point, it was overwhelming, you know, like just, um, you know, when you are, when you're friends, because I consider them my friends, when you're, when you're friends with people who are all in their 80s and 90s, you know, there were, there were over a hundred of them at this colony. So it just, it was very, very, um, numbing after a while. And I think I almost disengaged at a certain point. I just, um, you know, you know, Jaime did, did just died, uh, uh, not long ago, a few months ago. He had not been well. He had been in a um, kind of facility with Alzheimer's. So wow. it was painful. It is painful. Um, you know. He's so full of life in the documentary. You know, he's so with it. He's even even as he's complaining about this and that, he's fixing stuff right and left. So you're keeping in touch yeah. as much as possible. Yeah, I kept in touch. I made my rounds of calls and. Um, and then, like anything in life, you get really busy. Um, yeah. You know, I have my day job. I'm in touch with um, some of their children still. Um, but yeah, it's it's to lose that generation 
it's doubly painful because of the um the first hand you know accounts of what happened yeah. especially now where you have people who even would deny that the holocaust happened like you were saying on your youtube um channel um you know having the testimony of a survivor does nothing like it it's it's not really possible to sit in a room and hear someone talk about um auschwitz and think oh this person is making that up like you 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 have to really really be a, a psychotic or yeah. venal person to deny those stories and i think losing that this generation is really um it's just very painful you know what was the most beautiful moment for you in the f that it, we can show in the film that we can share with everyone here the friendship between um two of the characters olga and genya um there are two uh they're both widowed uh women who were um known each other since right after the war um if memory serves, they were married. Their their husbands were cousins. Anyway, they were they were related through marriage. One was Hungarian, one was Viennese. Viennese, um, but just had the most beautiful friendship. Ol Olga uh, uh, lived in Texas. Genya lived up in New York area. And every summer, Genya uh, Olga would travel from Texas to spend a month with Genya up in her bungalow, and such a really beautiful um relationship please forgive me i love you i spoke and too. i wish you 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 have the right i don't have the right why i don't have the right you Why take do I have care of it? Because you're all there. Oh, now you say to you the whole world. <laughs> you, <laughs> you take care of That's yourself. Okay. They had this like really wonderful way of talking to each other and gently teasing each other. It was very sweet. And they passed away before you were done with the film as well, right? Yeah. Any other mm. final scenes that we can show? And then. Um. God, I'm, getting, I'm getting very emotional. <laughs> um, I think they're um, the dancing. I think the the sort of the Saturday night um, the parties that they had and the the sort of gusto and um, zeal they had for those parties and. They would start in the early afternoon. Uh, they would, you know, a bunch of them would report the kitchen. They had a commercial kitchen, and they would um, start. You know, they prepare all the food themselves, and then they would. There's a scene in the film where they put all the food on the back of a, a golf cart and sort of bring it over to the casino and set it up there, and then they would um, really wear their finest uh, as if they're going to a wedding um suits and dresses and uh and they had a hell of a, a hell of a time they really lived life you know dancing people in barely walk dancing and i think this appetite for life is um you know is the most inspiring and in that even when you've had um been through such darkness and um such horrific trauma that you can still find joy in living and i think that's a lesson um for all of us you know yeah i would say ultimately i found it to be a profoundly uplifting story their stories were they were so full of darkness but it it is so full of affirmation of life of we take whatever it is and we keep dancing you know these guys reminiscing I don't know what, what his name was, but he can't hear, he can't see. And he's talking about his love for dancing, Cinderella, Cinderella, Aaron, and Monticello. Aaron Edelman, yeah. yeah. Oh, it was so lovely. Um, uh, listen, I tried to get away with everything. I want to be, even I'm, I'm 91 years old, 
and I'm a little bit sick man, you know. And last night I danced. I I try to do the best as you can as long as you live, and that's it. Cinderella, Cinderella. What we did this girl in Monticello. No, I was going to say, I, I was just going to agree with that. And I think that is, to me, the takeaway, is that um, that these people were, were really drawn to the light, even though they had been through such darkness. And uh, not every Holocaust survivor was like that. I mean, we know so many, you know, they took their own lives or they just lived in, they were just a heavy darkness their whole life. And I think these people were self-selecting and they were different. They were just different from the others. Yeah. What was the reaction to the documentary in general? Been quite positive. I, I really um, have to say I've never, um, have not encountered any of the ugliness that you have. Um, I've, um, you know, shown the film all over the country. I've spoken um, at a lot of places. Um, I think it's mostly a positive reaction, and um, um, and I'm finally paying off my credit card bills from <laughs> making that <laughs> film. <laughs> it's uh you know even, uh, documentaries don't 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 make you any money but uh no seriously it's it was a great experience i probably wouldn't make a film again um just because it takes a lot out of you um but i'm i'm glad to have done it and i feel like it was at least honoring their lives and their and their their memory you know we're gonna link to the documentary in the video description and we're also going to link to the Borscht Belt and the Borscht Belt Festival. <laughs> we're going to make sure to to promote that. Anything else we should share that you like to promote? No, that'll be it. You know, the Borscht Belt Fest um, this year, where we have a, a, both a Saturday and a Sunday. Um, Sunday, obviously, for um, uh, religious folk who can't come out on a Saturday and we'll have kosher food. And I uh, hope people come. I, I really want to see everyone out there this year um last year we had uh it was amazing um and uh, this year's two days so we'll what are what the happens. dates again july 27th and 28th what is your role there are you a comedian among the, the pro entertainers organizer i'm um yeah i'm just kind of doing everything um you know i'm the I'm board president of the museum but the festival was our project so uh, it's sort of taken over my life. So, yeah. <laughs> Great. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time and for this lovely discussion and most of all for that beautiful documentary for going through the effort of preserving such an important story and special story. And I want to thank the viewers and the podcast listeners for watching and thank you all and bye-bye.